seeking revelation from above. Divine revelation is what they got. And God gave them a totally different model. No longer authority flows from God to the government to the people. But rather authority flows from God to the people to the government. It is imperative that we understand this. The model divinely inspired in the Constitution is not authority flows from God to the government to the people, but from God to the people to the government. All authority under the Constitution is placed upon we the people. It's not coincidental that the first three words in the Declaration I mean, in the Constitution are we the people. All authority is placed upon us. And with that authority comes an awesome responsibility for us to elect righteous leaders. You see, if we understand that that's a divinely inspired model, if we don't elect righteous leaders, we're disobeying God. You know, in the book of Proverbs, Chapter 17, verse 15. It says, He that justifies the wicked and he that condemns the just, both of them are an abomination to the Lord. He that justifies the wicked and he that condemns the just. Let me ask you a question. If you are silent, are you not justifying the wicked? Silence is not an option. Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. He also said, not to speak is to speak. When we are silent, we are sending a powerful message. We don't give a flip. And that's why America is where it is today because too many of us have sat in our rear end when we should have been out there in the trenches. So we have a responsibility. You know, so many people of faith across America have said something that I am absolutely certain all of you have heard. Perhaps some of you have even said it. And it is this statement. Politics is a dirty business. I don't want any part of it. Have you heard it? I'm not going to ask you if you said it. <laughs> Politics is a dirty business. I don't want any part of it. And they wash their hands. Well, let me share with you another scripture from the book of Proverbs. It's Proverbs chapter 29 verse 2. And it says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, people mourn. Mm -hmm. Well, if the righteous, the people of faith, the people of principle are not voting, are not even running for office, what is left? The wicked electing the wicked. Right. <coughs> and we get what we deserve. Now, you know we get many so-called, quote, people of faith. Well, God put Obama in power. No, God didn't put Obama in power. We put Obama in power by sitting in our rear ends, in our pews, in our churches, instead of going to the voting booth and voting him out. Don't blame God for it. God placed that authority upon you in the Constitution. We have a civic and moral responsibility to exercise that responsibility that God placed upon us through the Constitution. So don't blame God. As a matter of fact, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, I was, this happened in two different churches that I was speaking, that I had whole families come forward and say, well, we never voted in our lives because of Romans 13. Because Romans 13 says that God appoints all authority, so why vote? You know what my response was? 
That's got to be the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. God appoints the office, we elect the person that sits in that office. As a matter of fact, let me share with you that the Bible tells you exactly who to vote for. The Bible tells you very clearly who to vote for. Let me put it in context. Moses has just crossed the Red Sea. And now Moses is in the wilderness trying to govern over a million people. And Moses is going bananas. <laughs> Here comes Jethro, his father-in-law. And Jethro says, Moses, what you're doing is not good. And in Exodus chapter 18, verse 21, God speaks to Moses through Jethro. And God says, you select from among the people. Now I want you to note carefully what God says. You select from among the people. Not God will appoint. No, you select, which is the same as you elect. You select from among the people. And then he gives four qualifications. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, <coughs> hating covetousness. That's how you vet every candidate. Let me define those terms. First, able men, and women of course. What does that mean? That means elect men and women that are capable of doing the job. <laughs> Let's stop electing the village idiot. <laughs> Number two, such as fear God. Well, if you fear God, you obey God's commands. Yes. We call that in America a Judeo-Christian ethic. Mm -hmm. What is a Judeo-Christian ethic? Well, first of all, it's a moral code of conduct. And then it is honesty, integrity, hard work, individual responsibility, the rule of law, and yes, free enterprise and limited government. And the Bible has a lot to say about all of these. So able men, such as fear God. Number three, men of truth. Let me ask you a question. Aren't you sick and tired of men and women of lies in government? I mean, whether it is Fast and Furious, or Benghazi, or the IRS, or the NSA, or Ebola, or the missing emails. It is lies upon lies upon lies. As a matter of fact, they tell you a new lie to cover up the previous lie. I'll ask you another question. Have you ever come across a candidate for public office that will tell you all these wonderful promises of what they're going to do when they get elected? only to get elected and do exactly the opposite? Yes. Anybody had that experience? Yes. But you know, that one is easy to fix. Just remember this. Stop listening to their rhetoric and start looking at their record. They all have a record. Stop listening to what they say. Start looking at what they do. Jesus put it this way. Ye shall know them by their fruit. It's about time we do some fruit checking. <laughs> now there's something else. I was talking to somebody at lunchtime, at dinner time, just a few minutes ago, I was talking to him. And I was saying, look, as I said before, our challenge is with the establishment in both parties. So we need to realize that the primary is even more important than the general. When we have these establishment politicians that are running for re-election, you make sure you have a constitutional conservative running against them in the primary and they give, get behind them to throw those guys out. Yes. 
we got to make sure that we have constitutional conservatives running in every primary election against these people that have been there as relics for 30 years. So able men, such as fear God, men of truth. Number four, hating covetousness. I'm going to tell you something interesting about covetousness. Covetousness in government is not really primarily about money. It is about power and control. These politicians covet power, and they covet the control that that power gives them over we the people. That's why we have politicians in Washington that have been there for 30 years, and they want to be there another 20. They don't want to relinquish that power. They are drunk with that power. Lord Acton once said, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. But the scripture continues. You select from among the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and he continues, and appoint them as rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of ten. So here is the model. Moses, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of ten. That's equivalent to federal government, state government, county government, local government. Verse 22, and only take up to Moses, that is to the federal government, matters of great importance. Everything else you handle yourself at the local level. That is the essence of federalism. That is the essence of limited government. That is Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. That's the Ninth Amendment and the Tenth Amendment. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution is called the Enumerated Powers of Congress. Eighteen powers described in Article 1, Section 8. If it ain't there, federal government's got no business being involved in it. Let me give you a couple of examples. The word education, nowhere in Article 1, Section 8. And does it make any sense to have a bunch of unelected bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. telling us how to educate our children and grandchildren, cramming down secular humanism and common core and all that garbage down our throats? No. That decision needs to be at the local level with parents and teachers and maybe a local school board. According to Article 1, Section 8, the Department of Education is unconstitutional. We ought to get rid of it. Yeah. Let me tell you another word that is not in Article 1, Section 8. It's a word, environment. <laughs> Nowhere in Article 1, Section 8. Let me tell you if there are two entities of the federal government that have done more damage to the economy of this country is the Endangered Species Act and the EPA. Mm -hmm. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of regulations that make it practically impossible for anyone to start a new business and makes the cost of business for especially for all the small businesses in America which produce two-thirds of all the jobs in America makes it very difficult to compete. Yeah. We need to get rid of all those regulations and allow the entrepreneurial America with their creativity to create millions upon millions of jobs across America. <laughs> you know, as Ronald Reagan said it, government is not the solution, government is the problem. We don't need more government, we need less government. And what we need is take all this power out of Washington and bring it to the states, bring it to the local level. Yes. So, what do we need? We need for us to go back to what the framers had in mind. Follow the Constitution, follow the rule of law. Live within your means, you know, if you make $4,000 a month and you spend 5000 how long can you do that? 
Well, our government hasn't learned that. <clears throat> and, then, and, and they want what they call their money. It's not their money. Right. Every nickel you give them as taxes is your money. It's not their money. As a matter of fact, let me tell you a secret. Government cannot give you anything it didn't first take away from you. Yes, government cannot create jobs. That's a lie. Government cannot create jobs. All it has to do is get out of the way so you can create the jobs. <laughs> so we have to realize that God has entrusted us with America. This is the hope of the world. This is the beacon of light throughout the world. Do you realize even for the gospel, America has sent probably 90 to 95% of all the missionaries throughout the world, and we finance all the mission efforts throughout the world. There are countries that have found democracy because of the example of America. And yet, we have an administration today apologizing for America all over the world, trying to appease our enemies while they throw the nation of Israel under the bus. As a matter of fact, it was so shameful how this president have treated Prime Minister Netanyahu. You know, a few months ago, my son was invited to speak in Washington, D.C. at a, an organization calling themselves Middle Eastern Christians. And at this meeting, he was talking about how we needed to stand unequivocally for the nation of Israel and for the Jewish people. And he began to be booed. And the booze began so loud that my son said, look, if you do not stand with Israel, if you don't stand with the Jews, I cannot stand with you. And he turned around and walked out. <laughs> Let me tell you, the word of God tells us in Genesis 12, 3, God speaking to Abraham, the father of Israel. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. This current administration has cursed the Jewish people, has caused, cursed the nation of Israel more than any other administration in history. I believe the only reason judgment has not fallen upon America is because of the faithful remnant that is standing in the God. But it is about time that we stand for righteousness. Now, that means that we need to take the responsibility. You know, we are very quick about saying, you do it. You realize every time you go like that, you got three fingers pointing at you? <laughs> we have to take the responsibility. But I'll tell you what, if each and every one of us stands shoulder to shoulder saying America is worth fighting for. We can recover America. We can make America again that shining city on a hill. I want to finish with the last few words in the Declaration of Independence where those framers say, relying upon the protection of divine providence we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Our lives, our lives are under attack from the cradle to the grave. Since 1973, <clears throat> when nine unelected justices of the Supreme Court decided that a baby in the womb did not have that unalienable right to life as stated in the Declaration of Independence. And they legalized abortion. 58 million babies have been murdered in America by abortion. God help us. 
And at the other end, it's not better. This administration is promoting euthanasia, uh, doctor-assisted suicide. As a matter of fact, you look at Canada, you look at England, where they have socialized medicine. And for the elderly, is a waiting period of approximately 18 months to have any medical procedure. What makes you think it's going to be any different in America? Because Obamacare is socialized medicine. And as a matter of fact, that is already happening in America. We have seen veterans, men and women that have put their lives on the line to defend our freedom, die because of denied care by the VA hospital. That is a travesty. That is criminal. And in between, our quality of life is eroded by taxation and regulation. You see, we not only need to get rid of the EPA, we need to get rid of the IRS also. <laughs> our treasure, give me a break. This government has both their hands in your pocket trying to take every hard-earned dollar you make to give it out in handouts to buy votes. But I'll tell you something. They can take our lives. They can take our fortunes. But no one can take our honor. No one can take our honor. I want us to stand. And if you're here with your spouse or a relative, I want you to face one another. Otherwise, face me. And I want us to make a covenant to one another before God. I am going to repeat this covenant one statement at a time. I want you to repeat it before God from the heart. I'm going to say it one phrase at a time. You repeat it after me from the heart. Relying upon the protection of divine providence. Relying upon the protection of divine providence. No, 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 no. I don't hear much heart there. <laughs> Let, let's try it one more time. From the heart. Relying upon the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other. We mutually pledge to each other. Our lives. Our lives. Our fortunes. Our fortunes. And our sacred honor. To do, all we can to do all we can to restore righteousness to America. To do all we can to restore limited government and the rule of law. To restore the Constitution and free enterprise. To make America again. Again. That shining city on a hill. So help me God. Thank you. God bless you. God bless America.